it is rather like a large flywheel. Even after we stop cranking the wheel, the rotational energy stored by the wheel keeps it spinning. Even when all the firing is stopped, the energy stored in the refractory walls continues to radiate heat to the process tubes. But without flow, there is no way to carry the heat away from the tubes. Therefore, the tubes overheat. The temperature of the tubes may approach the temperature of the refractory at the point in time when flow is lost. The refractory temperature is indicated by the firebox temperature or the temperature of the flue gas flowing from the firebox into the convective section. A typical firebox temperature is 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, the heater tubes can reach 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit on loss of the process flow, even though the fuel flow has been immediately stopped. Tubes with a low chrome content may bend and distort as a result of such overheating. Even at 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, residual liquid left in the tubes when flow is lost may thermally degrade to a carbonaceous solid or heavy polymer that fouls the interior of the tubes. One way to combat this problem is with steam. As soon as the flow is interrupted, high-pressure purge steam is automatically opened into the heater tube inlets. The steam blows the residual liquid out of the tubes and also helps remove heat from the tubes. Stuttering feed interruption. After the purge steam begins to flow, the refractory walls and the tubes slowly cool. However, if process flow is reintroduced to the heater during this cooling period, a serious problem may result. The first few gallons of process liquid flowing through the heater will become extremely hot. The liquid may get so hot that it will turn to solid coke and partially plug the heater tubes. If this problem, the sudden loss of flow, followed by the premature restoration of flow, occurs repeatedly over a period of a few hours, then layers of fouling deposits or coke are accumulated inside the tubes until a heater shutdown becomes unavoidable. This sort of failure is called a stuttering feed interruption. Modern technology has come a long way in mitigating such problems. In new heaters, lightweight ceramic tiles, rather than massive brick refractory walls, are the norm. These ceramic tiles do not store very much heat. Hence, when the heater process flow is reduced or lost, as long as the fuel flow is quickly curtailed, the tubes tend not to overheat. Adiabatic Combustion In 1980, there was a strike at the Amaco oil refinery in Texas City. An engineer was assigned during this emergency to work as the chief operator on the sulfur plant. He was the engineer who had designed the sulfur plant of that refinery. Therefore, the refinery manager thought that he would be the logical person for the chief operator's job. A sulfur plant converts H2S to elemental sulfur through the partial oxidation of H2S. H2S plus O2 plus N2H2O plus N2 plus S, vapor. This reaction takes place in an adiabatic combustion chamber, shown in picture. This chamber has no tubes to absorb radiant heat. Plenty of radiant heat is liberated, but only to the refractory brick walls. The bricks then re-radiate the heat back into the gaseous products of reaction. This is called adiabatic combustion because no heat is lost from the combustion reaction to radiation. The adiabatic combustion temperature for the preceding reaction is about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. The refractory used to contain this high temperature is manufactured from 90% alumina. Such refractory may be exposed to temperatures of up to 2,900 degrees Fahrenheit without damage. During the strike, the sulfur plant was shut down for minor repairs. He had to supervise its start-up. Mainly, he had to reheat the adiabatic combustion chamber to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit before restoring the flow of H2S. This was done by burning a controlled amount of methane or natural gas with a carefully regulated flow of air. The idea was to slowly heat up the combustion chamber with hot flue gas by 100 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. This slow reheat was needed to avoid cracking the refractory bricks because of uneven heating. To carry away a portion of the heat of combustion of the natural gas, they used pipeline nitrogen. He thought it best to control the flows of nitrogen, natural gas, and air, himself. 
Basically, the other people at the sulfur plant were head office people, whom he did not trust. The reheat phase of the startup seemed to be going quite slowly. The combustion chamber temperature crept up by 50 degrees Fahrenheit an hour, rather than the normal 150 degrees Fahrenheit per hour. To speed the reheat, he reduced the nitrogen flow. This helped, but not by much. It all seemed so odd. Especially as the interior of the chamber, viewed through the sight port shown in picture, had a dazzling white appearance. He remembers thinking, he cannot spend the rest of my life out here. He will have to speed this along. So, he shut off the nitrogen and turned up the gas and air. Finally, the chamber temperature started to climb at a respectable rate. But then he began to see something in the chamber that was utterly impossible. Of course, peering through the glass sight port, it is hard to see very well. But it seemed to him as if the opposite refractory wall was very slowly, but still perceptibly melting. But this could not be, for several good reasons. Reason number one, the 90% alumina refractory was rated for 3000 degrees Fahrenheit service. Reason number two, the indicated combustion chamber temperature was still only 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Reason number three, he was a nice person and bad things should not happen to nice people. After two hours, it became clear that the openings in the opposite refractory wall were shrinking. These openings permitted the hot flue gas to exit the combustion chamber and flow into the tubes of a heat recovery boiler. The apparently melting refractory was sagging and restricting these apertures. He noticed, with a sinking heart, that the combustion chamber pressure was steadily rising. It rose from 2 to 12 psig, at which point the fuel gas tripped off as a result of the high pressure. The sulfur plant startup was aborted. But what had happened? An investigation showed that the thermal well, a steel or ceramic tube containing the thermocouple wires, was not fully inserted into the adiabatic combustion chamber. The end of the thermal well was only halfway into the 12-inch thick refractory wall, as shown in shown in picture. Therefore, the thermocouple was measuring the relatively cool zone inside the refractory wall, rather than the far hotter zone in the combustion chamber. He should have paid closer attention to the physical appearance of the chamber. Bricks glowing bright red are radiating heat at about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Bricks glowing a dazzling white are radiating heat above 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, shown in table. How hot did the refractory surface get? This value can be calculated if we assume the following. Fuel was 100% methane. Complete combustion, implying theoretically perfect air-fuel gas mixing. No excess oxygen. No heat losses to surroundings. Air is available at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Pipeline nitrogen shutoff. Then the calculated temperature of the combustion chamber is 3,800 degrees Fahrenheit. This is called the adiabatic flame temperature. Such a temperature is quite sufficient to turn even bricks into a high viscosity, lava type, semi solid fluid. The refinery manager was not particularly pleased. He unjustly blamed him for this incident. Just because he had designed the sulfur plant, was the chief operator, and had been personally restreaming the sulfur plant, he said it was all his fault, and that he should have known better. Heater Tube Failures Heater tubes are designed to operate at a particular pressure and temperature. The design pressure of the tube is not the inlet operating pressure of the heater. The design tube pressure is the heater charge pump dead head, or shut-in, pressure. The design temperature of the tube is not the heater outlet process operating temperature. The design tube temperature is the anticipated or calculated maximum tube skin temperature at end of run conditions, which is simply the temperature of the exterior metal surface of the tube. Many plants call this temperature the tube metal indication, TMI. The calculated tube skin temperature is mainly a function of the fouling resistance assumed inside the tube. The greater the assumed fouling resistance, the higher the design tube skin temperature, and the thicker the tube wall. 
In a sense, then, we partially assumed the design tube thickness on the basis of experience for a particular plant service. A typical process heater tube diameter is 4 to 10 inches. Tube thickness is usually between 0.25 and 0.50 inch. Heater tubes are often constructed out of chrome steel. A high chrome content is 13%. The chrome content increases the heat resistance of the tube. A tube with 11 to 13% chrome content can normally withstand a skin temperature of up to 1300 to 1350 degrees Fahrenheit. A low chrome content tube of perhaps 3% may be limited to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit tube metal temperature. Naturally, the pressure, thickness, and diameter of the tube all affect its maximum skin temperature limitations. For added corrosion and temperature resistance, the nickel content of tubes and sometimes the molybdenum content as well are increased. Tubes with a high nickel content are classified as 300 series stainless steels. A 0.5% silicon content is used to enhance the tube's oxidation or exterior scaling resistance. An engineer had a job working in a refinery. The unit bottleneck that he was consulting for was the furnace. Both the firing rate and TMI temperature were low. However, the tubes themselves were ordinary carbon steel. Not only the convective tubes, but the radiant tubes, all were carbon steel. Theoretically, engineering calculations showed carbon steel was adequate. Note that the furnace specs were issued by an American contractor and not the local. Theory is fine, but it needs to be tempered with common sense. Process heaters in refinery hydrocarbon service should employ chrome steel and not carbon steel tubes in the radiant wall and shock tubes. Carbon steel tubes should be confined to the convective section. High temperature creep. When the tube metal temperature exceeds a value of 1,300 to 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes plastic. This means that the pressure inside the tube causes the tube diameter to expand. This is called high temperature creep. As the diameter of the tube bulges and expands, the tube walls become progressively thinner and ultimately too thin to constrain the pressure inside the tube, and the tube bursts. Large diameter tubes operating at higher pressures and with a thin wall thickness fail at a relatively low tube skin temperature. Tubes seldom fail because of external oxidation and tubes rarely burn up. They fail because of high temperature creep, which causes the tube to expand and burst. Thus, the fundamental cause of tube failure is a high localized temperature, which is called a hotspot. Purge steam. When a heater tube fails, the process fluid spills out into the firebox. Let's assume that the process fluid is a combustible liquid. Will the leaking process fluid burn? There is probably not enough excess oxygen